Okay. Welcome to the board down there, school board meeting of November 22nd, 2022. I think we'll start the first thing here is a call to order and roll call. Mr. Panarello. Here. Mr. Updegrove. Here. Mr. Zawada. Here. Mrs. Scott. Here. Ms. Deroff. Present. Mr. Hemingway. Here. Mrs. Hogan. Present. Ms. Nyman. Here. Mr. Brophy. Here. All present. Next is the Pledge of Allegiance and a moment of silence, please. I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, just to remind everybody, November 22nd, 1963 uh, was a date that uh, shocked the nation. So uh, let's hope that things like that, the assassination of presidents and, and uh, public figures or any assassination at all don't continue on. And we get to become more civilized in how we treat people and think of others. Okay, there was a previous executive session uh, on personnel. It lasted 15 minutes. Next, approval of the October 25th, 22nd, 2022 School Board of Directors meeting minutes. Do I have a motion? Hogan motions. Zawada second. Hogan motions. Zawada second. Roll call vote. Mr. Panarello. Yes. Mr. Updegrove. Yes. Mr. Zawada. Yes. Mrs. Scott. Yes. Ms. Deroff. Yes. Mr. Hemingway. Yes. Mrs. Hogan. Yes. Ms. Nyman. Yes. Mr. Brophy. Yes. Motion passes. And now for a thing I'm kind of worried about here. <laughs> this is our, uh, our student spotlight, and I have in front of me a whole lot of people to look like they could, speak of that violence thing I just talked about and, and, not, and not go there. I'm going, to, I'm going to continue on that frame, uh, but this is the student spotlight. I I don't have any information. That's all right. We're going to hand it right over to, to Mrs. Moore. Okay, there you go. You have it. I do. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, Amy Musapapa, who is sitting behind me and is the executive director of the Foundation for Boyertown Education, and I meet every Monday morning to collaborate and to keep each other in the know. As we have gotten to know one another, she has shared her experiences with Donnie Ellickson and his Taekwondo Academy, both as a mom and as someone who works with Mr. Ellickson on marketing their program. Um, to say that her passion is contagious would be an understatement. And I found myself spending a recent Friday evening at the Academy watching mesmerized as children and adults practiced for an upcoming black belt test. Out of Ellickson's Academy alone, BASD has more than 25 students who have achieved their first degree black belt or higher since 2004. Included in this fall's group are three seventh graders. They are each 12 years old. Mr. Ellickson does not permit his students to test until they are 12 so as to allow them time to mature. They did not take a junior or youth test. All three of these kiddos took the regular first degree black belt test as part of a group of nine school age students and additional adults, and they passed. They are now black belts at 12 years of age. Shortly, each of the black belts here tonight will int introduce themselves. They are here not only to celebrate their martial arts achievements, but to celebrate an amazing program which focuses not only on their specific form of martial art, but also on their academic performance, behavior at home and school, and their character. There are five tenets of Taekwondo, courtesy, integrity, perseverance, self-control, indomitable spirit. While the research exists, we don't need to quote that research to recognize that mastering those tenets has a direct impact on the development and performance of these students across all aspects of their lives, including their educations. 
Within the first five minutes of talking with Mr. Ellickson, I had my story and knew the focus of tonight's student spotlight. He didn't talk to me about fighting or self-defense. He talked to me about his students who are also our students. He talked to me about expectations. He shared that in order to be eligible to test for their black belt, a martial arts student at his academy must not only be the master of their craft, they must also perform academically and demonstrate respectful behavior both at home and at school as attested to by their parents. So if they're not performing in school or behaviorally, he does not allow them to test for their black belt. Mrs. Muzapapa has shared that students at the academy are given writing and art assignments as part of their training. I witnessed sheer beauty as the students perform to music to honor the history of their art. Yes, they are physical specimens trained in combat and self-defense, but they are so much more than that thanks to their training. Tonight, Mr. Ellickson is here to talk about the ties between academics and the martial arts as they relate to his program. We will share a video and you will meet the students here with us tonight. You will hear from his three children, all of whom are black belts, as they share how their practice of Taekwondo has impacted their academic career, and from Mrs. Ellickson about the Academy's journey into the world of reality television. And finally, you will have a chance to ask questions. So without further ado, Mr. Ellickson. Thank you, Miss Allison, uh, that warm introduction, a lot to live up to there. Uh, my name is Donnie Ellickson. Uh, my wife, Jana, and I run uh, Ellickson's Taekwondo in uh, Boyertown. Those that don't know, we've been there 28 years. Um, I started the school when I was 19. I was a, didn't have a, a great upbringing, I was a bad kid. Martial arts literally saved my life. Uh, so that's where I teach from. Um, I'm a tough love instructor. I pull no punches and I expect a lot out of my students. And they, uh, they, they step up, you know, it's, it's, it's an amazing process. We feel blessed to be part of it. Um, my children, Tristan, Charlie, and Piper, uh, all uh, got their black belts. Um, those that don't know, we live at the Taekwondo school. So um, we have an apartment above the Taekwondo school. So as you say, we are all in. <laughs> um, uh, you know, our, our, our black belt test, which we're going to uh, kind of get a peek at in a little bit, I know is kind of the focus of tonight. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's not an easy test. We pride ourselves on being a, a challenging test. Uh, from day one, when students come in, we observe the students' needs. Um, I always like to think that I'm in the inspiration business. Uh, martial arts, fitness, goal setting, all that stuff happens, stress relief. But really, we're, we're inspiring. We're, we're trying to inspire a student from day one maybe to lose weight, maybe to get in shape, maybe to learn self-defense, maybe to better themselves. I think a common um, lesson that we're, we're all doing is what we want to be better tomorrow than we are today. Uh, you know, and, and it's, it's not a perfect system, but as long as we're striving, you know, to be better tomorrow, then I think we're making an impact on ourselves and, and the community. Um, the black belt test, um, yeah, it's, we don't have a junior test, we don't have a, a youth test. Uh, these students go through the same black belt test uh, that adults do. And um, challenging is the, really the only, um, is, is the only uh, way to make it. As far as, you know, I guess that's way, the way I was raised, it worked for me. So, you know, we're, we're passing on the same lessons to them. Um, it's not easy. Um, there's obstacles, but each class, almost every class, or at times in a person's training, they hear the quote, are we going to quit or try harder? I mean, that's us to the core. You really have those choices in life. You know, you're going to quit or try harder. And we're not big on uh, whining. So we just like get in action and, and move towards, uh, you know, bettering ourselves or the situation. Um, we live by example. Um, those that don't know, our school collapsed in a snow blizzard in 2010. February 10th, 2010, our life changed. Um, the Schmoyer building is where we're at, the old Schmoyer building. Um, for those that know that is where we're at and it collapsed in a snow blizzard whole thing collapsed lost everything um, Thank goodness not a person was inside. I mean gosh, they're so so lucky on so many levels um, but after that I had uh, 
after about two months of depression, <laughs> I said, what are we going to do? We got to make a plan to get out of this. You know, we, you know, uh, so I put together a plan. We rebuilt the school. It took three and a half years. Uh, a lot of community friends and family ended up chipping in. It was built with a lot of love. Uh, and it's just a testament to, you know, the people that uh, are passionate about what we do there. Um, COVID, um, you know, we, um, uh, we, we did amazing through COVID. My staff did amazing through COVID. Somehow we uh, managed, we engineered a heck of a, again, uh, when March happened, 2020, a couple weeks of depression, <laughs> not knowing what the heck I was going to do. I mean, I literally uh, have a school where everybody's, 50 people are in the room breathing all over each other, right? So imagine that. And I live upstairs. So uh, literally had over 100 people a day come in our home starting June 2020. Uh, so we kept doing and were able to do uh, what we love, you know. And uh, so we, uh, again, after two weeks, engineered a heck of a system, a safety system, even our breathing. We changed, uh, we closed our mouths, breathed in and out through the nose. Uh, we didn't do sparring, no close contact. But with some minor uh, adjustments, we were able to keep doing what we love. So the point of those two stories is, um, in my position, I got to walk the walk. Right, because if I'm if I'm in the inspiration business, I'm asking uh, these guys to do X, Y, and Z. Uh, then I have to do the same things too. I have to look at myself, my own faults, uh, my own shortcomings, and, and try to better them. And I'm very honest with my staff, my school. Uh, that's really an extension uh, of my family. Um, so um, our black belt test, as Miss Allison said, um, students. I guess um, a long time ago, I realized that uh, we had something that people wanted to do, kids and adults, especially the kids. And in the very beginning, if you could inspire a kid to want to train, want to learn martial arts, and uh, want to get their black belt, then it's amazing what you can have them do. <laughs> so each belt test, all of these students have to get signed from their parents as they're coming up. Belt tests are about every four to five months. Um, we run a, a, like I love to say, an old school program. It takes about six to eight years to get your black belt in our school. A lot of commercial schools are three years nowadays. That's kind of the, you know, people want that black belt really fast. Um, so anyway, about every four to five months, they're testing, and they have to get a paper signed from their teachers saying academics is up in school and behavior's up at home. Uh, and if they don't get that signed, then we have a meeting, and then the mentoring begins. I do a mentorship with them for once a week. I meet with the parents. Um, they, we establish the problem, whether it's grades or hitting their sister or not doing their chores or not going to bed on time. Uh, we address the problem, and then every week I meet with them. So it's an account, you can imagine, it's an accountability program. They have to come in, they have to face me, <laughs> and it's a short conversation from there. Every week, is a, I tell the parents, a 30-second meeting. I want to know, is it the same? Is it better or worse? I'm not big on talking. I want results. Um, so, um, and they step up. They step up because they want that belt, right? They want that carrot. You know, so it, it's a pretty beautiful process. Um, so that's the belt promotion permission form. Um, pay it forward. We started about 15 years ago. Pay It Forward has nothing really to do with martial arts, but a lot of, uh, about giving back. Um, as part of a student's black belt test in their last year of training, they have to do 25 hours of community service. Um, they, we've worked with the train, we've worked with um, ambulance, we've worked with BBB, BMBA, uh, stuff around our academy. So they have to give back. They do 25 hours of community service. So each year, we're doing about four to 500 hours of community service uh, in the community, which uh, nothing about martial arts, but it gets that warm and fuzzy feeling. <laughs> um, so um, that's about all I have. We, we have a video. We do. That's, Ms. Um, Ms. Papa did a video for us. So. Yes. So it's a video of our black belt test. Uh, enjoy. And thank you for having us, everybody. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you for taking interest. Black belt and follow the journey into oneself, a lot of self discovery. And through that process, uh, the five tenets come into play in one's character uh, integrity, 
courtesy, self-control, perseverance, and indomitable spirit. And um, by the time you make it to Black Belt, it's not just the physical um, prowess that you have, it's, 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 it's part to affect your character, which uh, you know, in many ways is even more important than the physical. A tough program, we kind of pride ourselves on a tough program. Uh, riddled through all of our classes, our challenges, from young kids to teenagers to adults. Uh, and those challenges are there for a reason, because we're there to help to the community. Those challenges are what make you who you are. So at this time, I'm going to ask each of the students to stand up where they are and introduce themselves. And then we're going to spend some time with the rest of the Ellickson family. So if you want to go ahead and go first, that would be awesome. Uh, Adriana Sheridan, graduated class of 2018, and I am a first degree black belt. Isabel Deputy, I'm a freshman at BASH, First degree black belt. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Dylan Swank, uh, class of 2021, and I'm a third degree black belt. I'm Miles Onler, I'm a sophomore at BASH, and I'm a second degree black belt. Travis? Hi, my name's Charlie Ellison, I'm a first degree black belt, and I'm a third degree black belt. I'm Piper Ellison, I'm a seventh grader, and I'm a first degree black belt. Asia Swank, I was class of 2018, I'm a first degree black belt. Shane Seeker, I'm in eighth grade at Middle School West, first degree black belt. Um, Tristan Ellickson, uh, freshman, first degree black belt. Owen Seaman, senior at BASH, first degree black belt. Lucas Famous, I'm a senior at BASH and I'm a second degree black belt. Nolan Smith, I'm a seventh grader at Middle School, e middle school Middle School East, and I'm a first degree black belt. Harry Miller, I'm an eighth, eighth grader at Middle School East, and I'm a first degree black belt. 
Uh, James Tibiage, uh, sophomore at Bash, uh, first degree black belt. My name is Axel Gonzalez. I'm fourth degree black belt. I graduated 2008. Nicole Shimakonis, class 2025, 20, sophomore, second degree black belt. Thank you for being here. So, Ellison Kiddos, if I could have you join me up here, that would be great. My burn, Charlie, and Tristan. They're going to talk to you a little bit about their experience and how martial arts has impacted their academics. Hello. Um, I'm a ninth grader at Border Town, and I've been doing Taekwondo since I could walk. Um, a saying uh, we have at the academy, Matt lessons, life lessons. Matt lessons that I believe have helped me in academics um, is manners, life balance, and hard work. For example, manners have opened the doors for communication with myself and teachers. Um, I've learned that balance is important when juggling school, sports, and martial arts. My father has drilled into me that nothing great in life is achieved without hard work. Um, these lessons have given me confidence in school, sports, and life in general. That's what. Hi, my name is Charlie Ellickson. I'm 12 years old and a 7th grader at West. My family and I live above, live above my parents' Taekwondo Academy. I've been in martial arts ever since I can remember. Martial arts has taught me that life is full of obstacles and challenges, and that when I have a challenge in school or life, I have two choices. I can quit or try harder. At different times in, my, in class, my father would yell, do we quit or try harder? The whole class yells back, try harder, sir. This matters because if I'm on a test or a quiz or etc., I know that I have to try harder and not give up. Um, I'm Piper Ellison, and I'm a seventh grader at Middle School West. And um, martial arts has helped me with academics, um, with my self discipline, because if I have an assignment, I don't like procrastinate and do it like last minute. I do it before the due date. And um, even if I don't want to do it, I still do it. And <laughs> um, it also boosts my confidence, like in class. Um, um, I feel like people that do martial arts are more likely to like raise their hand or volunteer to do stuff because they have the confidence to do it. So that's how martial arts has helped me in academics. So, as I mentioned when I introduced everyone, the Ellicksons and their academy have ventured into the world of reality television. Um, so, if Mrs. Ellickson, you could come over and let us know a little bit about that, and then we have one final video for you guys. Hi, good evening. My name is Jana Ellickson. I am the parent of Charlie Piper and Tristan, and the wife of Donnie. I got my black belt in the year 2000, and have been training and teaching at the Academy ever since. So in July 2021, we were approached by Donnie's instructor, Grandmaster John Chung, to do this martial arts reality TV show. So two days later, without much knowledge or direction, our family was interviewed by Discovery Plus TV personnel, and we failed. We failed the interview, they didn't want us. And when Mr. Chung found out, he said to them, you need to have this family involved. So the second interview we passed. So we got on this TV reality show and um, they started filming our family and three other schools. We competed at five different tournaments. They filmed the wins, they filmed the losses, the parent-kid dynamic, and also the student-teacher dynamic, and a bunch of drama in between. Um, the show was quite, is quite entertaining, was quite entertaining, and represented our family and our academy really well. Um, in conclusion, we had an amazing experience, we met some great people, and we learned and we grew. So thank you very much for having us.
and have good holidays. Thank you. Thank you. We have 10 ranks in martial arts under black belt. There's 10 ranks in the military system, martial arts, military, martial, combat, art. And we follow that rule. We start out with a no belt. It's kind of like a buck private when you join the military. And then there's senior officers, fourth degree black belt, fifth degree black belt, and sixth degree black belt. And that's why we're here today. Seventh degree, eighth degree, and on are Grand Masters of Martial Arts. So Donnie doesn't know this, and I appreciate the extra time we've taken tonight for student spotlights, but um, I went and did some snooping around trying to look at Kitty Kai a little bit. And my impression of Kitty Kai in general, when not viewing Boyertown stuff, um, there's a lot of, it's, it's about the art of war, for lack of a better way to say it. It's about sparring and kicking butt and all that great stuff said a little stronger than I just said it. Um, and I just need you to know that not once have I seen that out of you. Not once. That's not your focus. And I'm beyond impressed at what you're doing with young people today and the impact that you're having in our schools. So I wanted to say thank you to you. Um, it's been a really neat experience putting this together. So Congratulations to all of you. Thank you all for being here tonight. Um, any questions before I let them go? <laughs> what age group do you take? We start in, uh, not a lot of schools do. We start them at three and four year olds. Uh, three, and the three, to four, three to five year olds, I'm sorry, is Little Dragons. It's light on the martial arts, big on the developmental. So that age is to get them out having fun, get them sharing, taking turns working with other kids. Um, uh, I'm looking at the older people. <laughs> <laughs> what age? Oh, at, 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 oh, that's old. That's, I taught. I taught. I don't know if uh, if anybody knows these ladies from the community, but I taught two ladies. One was 78 years old, Ruth Miller, and Peg Peg Poyer was 73. And uh, Peg, uh, Ruth got up to her red belt. I tell you, they love sparring because nobody would hit them. <laughs> they just go in and punch people in the head, and nobody would hit them back. Uh, they were a trip. Uh, as, as as old as you come, um, there are. I, I do take safety in, into consideration. I have to. So uh, the the very the, we let everybody come try two free weeks, and that's kind of the process of people interviewing us and we interviewing them. I'm, I'm inquiring about joints, uh, knees, backs, uh, you know, ankles hips, stuff like that, so as the process. But um, you know, you take we're laid back, you take it one class at a time. If you like it. At thirty nine I can still absolutely absolutely, absolutely. You call me. Thank you. You call me. Okay. Well I just wanted to acknowledge the group and um, it is a pleasure to have you here and it is also um, wonderful for us to expose our students who don't follow traditional um, activities and I think that everybody has should have an opportunity to have the spotlight so you have provided this opportunity to include all of these wonderful students that are past and present Boyertown area school district students and their passion that they have um, with this activity so thank you and, and thank you for being here this evening I know that you were a little nervous for you know your introduction um, I can feel it every Tuesday that I sit here so uh, but thank you and and thank you for you know mixing both the the um, Taekwondo and the academics piece of it because it is a good connection so and I do have a new motto I can quit or I can try harder so um, thank you Thank you very much. Thank you. Mrs. Forshaw, I'm going to step out with them for a second and then I'll be back.
I guess it's pretty obvious why this 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 is the the best part of the meeting for me, <laughs> the most uh, enjoyable part and the part I look forward to each week. So, but now we need to move on. But here's another good part of the meeting also I look forward to. At this point, I'd like to go to the uh, to the student representative report. You're by yourself tonight. What's so, so you're going to do both sides? Yeah, instead of Olivia and me, it's going to just be me. So. <laughs> well, you can say who's saying what if you'd like. Okay. All right. Um, we ready to start? Sure. All right. So as you can tell, Olivia's not here tonight. Um, she wants to apologize. Uh, she has a minor cold going around, and she was advised not to be around a lot of people. So she'll be sitting this one out, but hopefully she'll be at the next one. So this month, we had a lot of exciting things going on. Um, one thing was we had our first luncheon of the year. Unfortunately, we couldn't get the information in for this report, but we're hoping for the next one. All right. First thing, we had Harvest Ball that was supposed to be held at Bash this uh, month. Unfortunately, we had a lack of tickets sold, so it is rescheduled to March 3rd, and we're hoping that a lot of students come out and have a fun night and buy our tickets. Also, on the 4th of November, we had the Border Towns NJROTC program had their military ball. Olivia was in attendance and she had shared some of her experience there, so I'll read it for her. She said, I was actually invited to this event and it was definitely a night to remember. There was amazing food, good laughs, and tons of crazy dance moves. It was a very special night for the seniors of ROTC. Something really cool that the senior girls did this year was when it was time to announce the queen of the ball, the girls all wanted to stay princesses so they could all share the spotlight for their last year in ROTC together. Okay. We also had the powder buff came. Um, thank you for everybody who came out to it. Seniors and juniors both had a very fun time. Um, seniors won. Congratulations to them. And yeah, thanks to all who came to that. Okay. Another thing. So we had link for members that are eager, eager to be involved in their last event in August. Their continued discussions about possible upcoming events include a club fair on the 23rd of November and they are excited to see the outcome of this event. On November 4th and 5th, BASH had the incredible opportunity to host the 86th annual PAC State Conference. PASC is the Pennsylvania Association of Student Councils, which is a statewide organization. The State Conference is an annual event that allows student leaders, advisors, and keynote speakers from all over the state to come together and learn about leadership, network, strength, strengthen their skills, and simply meet and create bonds with people who are just like them. BASH held a successful two-day conference that hosted over 800-plus participants. The theme of the conference was cooking, in which the participants gathered their ingredients, honed their skills, and prepared their dish for leadership and success through a variety of activities, workshops, speakers, networking opportunities, and more. The conference ended with learning how to enjoy the dish, made with a large reflection on what was learned throughout the conference, and an impactful speech from a, bash, a past BASH, PASC student who is now a successful adult and remains active with the PASC State Executive Board. Overall, the conference ran amazing because of all the help and support that was given from the school and community leaders during this two-year two planning process. Also, Middle School East had a busy month. On the 17th, there was a choral concert full of amazing horses. Then the 18th was the end of the first trimester for them, which is a huge deal, already a third of the way through the year. Also on the 18th, there was the Wild West World Dance for Students, and I hope everyone had a great time. Last thing is, Middle School East also finished up their canned goods drive on November 16th. We want to thank everyone who donated, and we're sure that the students couldn't wait to see what teacher got to wear the turkey costume. All right. Thank you for everyone at the meeting tonight for listening to our news, and we're hoping to have even more stuff for next time. Have a happy Thanksgiving. You too. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much. We now, put, now move on to public comment period number one. 
We do have uh, some speakers. We have two speakers for uh, for comment period one. So I will read the. Uh, Okay. Okay. I get ahead of me. <laughs> so I'll read the uh, the statement of, on the comment period uh, period number one. On behalf of the board of school directors, I would like to welcome you to this meeting. We welcome your attendance and input from stakeholders to assist us in making recommendations and decisions related to the Boyer Town Area School District. This procedure and rules for public participation are detailed in BASD Policy 903. This document is available on the BASD website. Participants properly registered with the board secretary will be recognized by the presiding officer. Comment period number one is limited to topics on tonight's agenda. Participants must preface their comments by the announcements of their name. Participants are encouraged to direct all statements, inquiries, and questions to the presiding officer and or the board as a whole. Note that we value and will not compromise the privacy of our students and staff. Please see us outside the realm of public meeting if you have a concern about any individual staff member or student. If your public comment includes a question, Mr. Storcia or a member of our staff will be in contact with you to confirm your question and provide you with information. Comments are limited to three minutes and comment periods are limited to 30 minutes. Individuals may indicate a desire to speak a second time if there is time left in a 30 minute period. Finally, note that we do record our board and committee meetings and we post them on YouTube with a link to our website. We request that if you do wish to take pictures or record the meeting yourself, you do so in a non-disruptive and discreet manner and use those materials respectfully and responsibly. First speaker tonight will be Krista Collins, 14B Program of Studies. Good evening. Um, thank you all for the um, having the board meeting tonight. Um, so I am Krista Collins, Washington Township. I do want to divert from 14B for a second, though, because it still shows on the agenda the, the vote for Impact Club and also um, the Walk for Lives Club. I thought those were being taken off of the consent agenda vote for this evening. No? Okay. They're on itemized? Okay, I didn't realize that. Okay, thank you. So, um, all right, so I'll start on um, curriculum. So I wanted to talk about item 14B, and I wanted to ask the board why we are voting to pass a middle school curriculum when the original presentation was done over a year ago. I believe it was October 20 of October of 2021 um, board meeting, if I'm not mistaken, please feel free to correct me if that's not correct. Um, the curriculum meeting from November 10th did not focus on the changes to this curriculum, but it was more of a broad overview that should not count as prior notification or discussion. What are the differences between the old curriculum and the newly proposed curriculum? How will this challenge middle school children and prepare them for high school? These are just a few questions that I would appreciate a deeper dive into as part of an open and transparent board discussion. Discussion. As we all know, the test scores are way down all over the country. The after effects of COVID have done much damage to our kids, so it's important that it's, in, it's more than reasonable to ask the board to make sure that you do all the due diligence necessary to investigate a new curricula before passing it and make sure that these findings are available to the public with ample time for us to comment on them. For this reason, I am requesting that the board abstain from this vote until a more thorough presentation can be done for current members of the Boyertown School District. Also, in passing something as long-term and as important as a new curriculum, I would ask that the board members who create the agenda not bury things like this in the consent agenda, which they originally were under the consent agenda, because then you just pass them as one lump sum and there's no discussion, there's no transparency. So um, moving these things to allow for board discussion allows everybody to ask a lot more questions. Otherwise, it's just up to us to come up here and talk at you guys and hope that you listen. Um, also, I would like to ask that you do not vote to give the give accounts to Impact Club and the Walk for Lives Club tonight, simply until we can evaluate what they are asking for in their requests. There is nothing in there for parameters as far as who are presenters, who are speakers, what Unity Day um, encompasses, and also what is the leadership camp that they're talking about on their request to have the account. And um, also, the Walk for Lives Club, it says that they will donate the money raised to qualified groups is 
basically what it says. It doesn't use the term groups. So if they're raising money and they have students coming in and buying a t-shirt or a bracelet or whatever it is, I think that's awesome. But you need to make sure that they are not inadvertently donating that money to a potential political organization or group that would then donate that money back to political organizations. There's a lot of things going on with new 501c3s that pop up. They act like they're doing great things. They're donating money to the needy, the hungry, any of that. If that's what they're truly donating it to, that's great. But I think that we should put some requirements in place to make sure that those things are not inadvertently donated to groups that maybe don't really have the best interest in mind. Thank Time. you very much. Next, Nicole Zeltz. You passing? Okay, uh, Allison, could you let the orders in into the room so they can pursue the pre presentation? This is for the uh, audit report 2021. They've been left in, so they're they're ready to go when they're okay. ready. Okay. Let them in. Okay. We are ready for the presentation of the auditors. Hey, good evening. I uh, hope everybody's doing well tonight. Uh, I was fortunate to be able to uh, enjoy the previous presentation via your live stream. So uh, I'm unfortunately not going to be as exciting as the Taekwondo, but I think it's something very important. And I thank you for having me out here to discuss uh, the results of our audit for the year ended June 30, 2021. So our audit for the year ended June 30, 2021, uh, had two main focuses. So the first was on the financial statements uh, for the year ended June 30, 2021. And I'm pleased to report that we are issuing an unmodified clean audit opinion on those financial statements. And the second was on uh, an opinion on compliance with your major federal program which for the year under audit was your child nutrition cost of the national um, school lunch program as well as the national school breakfast program. Um, and we also issued an unmodified clean audit opinion on compliance with your major federal program. As part of our audit, we're required to disclose if we identify any material weaknesses or significant deficiencies in the internal controls over financial reporting or in the internal controls over compliance with your major federal program, I'm pleased to report that we did not identify any such deficiencies. Um, briefly highlighting some of the, the financial results for the year, um, you will see the district ended uh, that the year with total assets and deferred outflows of resources at the entity-wide level of about $209 million compared to a liability and deferred inflow base of $339 million. The bulk of those liabilities are the proportionate, the district's proportionate share of the net pension liability in the PEASERS plan. Um, and I will tell you, this was as of June 30, 2021. At that point in time, PEASERS was about 54% funded. Uh, the most recent numbers we've seen, they were up to 63% funded. So we are anticipating that that net pension liability number is going to shrink um, in future years. For the year, um, entity-wide, you saw about $128 million in revenue against $124 million in expenses, which saw an increase in the net position or a reduction in the, the net deficit of about $3.4 million. Um, so that is at the entity-wide level, which is a little bit different from your budgetary basis because it doesn't look at near-term cash in and cash out. It looks more at um, all of your assets, including buildings and equipment, and all of your liabilities, including long-term debt. So to get a little better understanding for how the year went for the, the district, I like to look at the fund level results and your general fund budget. Um, which was about $124 million budget 
on the revenue side and on the expenditure side. And you'll see the budget originally anticipated uh, having to utilize about $1.1 million in available fund balance. As a result of revenues, um, particularly um, transfer tax type revenues being a little better than anticipated, about 2% over budget, and expenditures coming in about $400,000 under budget, you were in fact able to uh, not have to take out a fund balance, but to be able to save a little bit more in your fund balance to help uh, balance your needs in future years. I will let you know that for the June 30, 2021 financial statements, uh, there was a new accounting standard that was required to be implemented regarding fiduciary activities. Uh, this impacted the district scholarship and student activities funds, but primarily the student activities funds. Historically, those funds were just treated as uh, amounts held on behalf of others, just as an asset and a liability. But under the new accounting standard, uh, we were required to um, assist the district in modifying the financial statements so that your student activity funds now show additions and deletions as inflows and outflows um, and show a net position in the student activities funds. Giving you a heads up about kind of what's coming next, there is a new accounting standard uh, for June 30, 2022 on lease accounting. So for your district, it's not gonna have as big an impact as it will have for, for some, but historically only certain um, leases that were, that met rigid criteria were treated as assets and liabilities, and the rest were just treated as operating leases where we just reflected an expenditure when paid. And at the fund level, that's gonna stay the same. But at the entity-wide level, uh, that first set of numbers that I was looking at, all except short-term leases, which are leases less than a year in length, are going to be considered an intangible right-to-use asset and a related lease liability. Um, so your financial statement, you're, you're going to see an increase in your assets as well as your liabilities. They'll be in approximately the same amount, so it's not going to impact your bottom line significantly. Um, Looking at your June 30, 2021 financial statements, had Gatsby Statement 87 been in place, you would be looking at about an extra $200,000 on the asset side and on the liability side. So not major, but it is a change that I wanted to make you aware of because it's something that um, if any of you work in other industries where you look at financial statements, it's a, a standard that has been um, going first from the major public corporations and smaller, now it's hitting governments and nonprofit organizations. So I did want to bring that um, to everyone's attention. Um, at this point, I'd like to open it up to any questions that anybody may have about the audit results of the audit process or about anything else that I might be able to speak to. The full audit report was shared a couple months ago with the board in one of the updates. Yes, I'm glad we finally got this audit report. It's like uh, 10 months past due. Um, I would have hoped that you would have been here. I do understand the issues out there, but we always got a, a hard copy of the report, which I know we can still look at on, online. So it's it's good to see that we did get this finally. Uh, hopefully this will not happen again because 10 months past due is unacceptable in my book. So thank you. And so I, I will admit I, um, I'm having a little trouble hearing what's in the room. Um, but I, I believe I heard that the comment was in regards to the timeline, and I agree there were, while there were a number of circumstances that, that went to it, certainly the timeline was not where we wanted it to be, and it's not what we anticipate going forward either. <coughs> Other questions, please? 
I see no other questions. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much. If there don't appear to be any other questions, thank you for your report. Uh, we look forward to the future ones coming in and, and uh, keeping us keeping us in the, the, the good side of the law. So that's, uh, that's what we're looking for. We want to stay in the good side of the balance. Thank you very much. Next will be report of the president. I have none. Uh, next will be finance reports. The treasurer's report. Draft October 2022. Good evening. I have some more numbers for you. Um, some highlights from October of 2022 treasurer's report. For local revenue, uh, delinquent tax collection was approximately 34500 Earned income tax collection was approximately $1,000,000. 317,300. Transfer tax collection was approximately 118,450. For state revenue, the PDE basic ed subsidy was approximately $2,468,860. PDE property tax relief payment was approximately 1,076,300. And the PDE pre-K subsidy was approximately 35,700. For federal revenue, grant subsidy was approximately $2,167,500. And regarding October expenditures, salaries, benefits, and professional services accounted for 65% of the monthly expenditures. And that concludes the Treasurer's Report. And Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Thank you very much. Happy Thanksgiving to you. Do I have a motion to accept the report? Hogan moves. Hogan, Hogan moves. Up to Grove seconds. Call vote. Mr. Panarello. Yes. Mr. Updegrove. Yes. Mr. Zawada. Yes. Mrs. Scott. Yes. Ms. Deroff. Yes. Mr. Hemingway. Yes. Mrs. Hogan. Yes. Ms. Nyman. Yes. Mr. Brophy. Yes. Motion carries. Okay, next we have the Secretary's report. No report this evening. Next, solicitor's report. No report. Next, superintendent's report. All right. Thank you, Mr. Brophy. Uh, under the consent agenda, I will be looking for the Board of School Directors to authorize the entry into a grievance settlement agreement with the Bordertown Area Education Association to resolve grievance number 2022-001. Hogan moves. That's a lot of seconds. Okay. okay, roll call vote. Mr. Panarello. Yes. Mr. Updegrove. Yes. Mr. Zawada. Yes. Mrs. Scott. Yes. Ms. Deroff. Yes. Mr. Hemingway. Yes. Mrs. Hogan. Yes. Ms. Nyman. Yes. Mr. Brophy. Yes. Motion carries. Under the superintendent's itemized agenda, I am looking for a motion to, from the school board, uh, the board of school directors to approve the resolution and amendment for the Portnoff Law Associates Delinquent Tax Collection Agreement to align with changes in Consumer Financial Protection Bureau guidelines. Hogan moves. Nyman seconds. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, I'll move to a roll call vote. Mr. Panarello. Yes. Mr. Updegrove. Yes. Mr. Zawada. Yes. Mrs. Scott. Yes. Ms. Deroff. Yes. Mr. Hemingway. Yes. Mrs. Hogan. Yes. Ms. Nyman. Yes. Mr. Brophy. Yes. Motion carries. Next, I am looking for the Board of School Directors to approve the 2023-2024 programs of studies for grades 6 to 8 and grades 9 to 12. I do want to uh, reiterate that both program of studies was reviewed last um, board meeting uh, by Dr. Maori, and the only change to the Bash Middle School uh, program of study will impact the math 
uh, alignment so that it is aligned with both the high school um, that's aligned from middle school through high school. It is to support the algebra keystone preparation, revise course names to better reflect focus of course, and um, align the PBE mandated keystone exam to end trigger courses. Also, the other change in the high school program of study is to now include a 0.2 GPA bump similar to AP courses for BASH dual enrollment courses to add um, dual enrollment microeconomics and the esports gaming concepts and equipment. Uh, also to include BASH Ocean World Studies, no longer a, a dual enrollment course. So BASH would like to bring that into the high school as well as uh, the BASH Act 158 Keystone Graduation Pathways. They updated the graphic to provide clarity. The program of study is the course selection. It is needed to be voted on because students begin their course selection in um, the beginning of the school year. It also impacts our budget with regard to staffing and what our staffing needs are. By no means does it imply um, resources, textbooks, etc. You're not voting on anything other than the program of study, which is done routinely each year so that students can begin to put their schedules together for the next school year. Hogan moves. Uh, Hogan and Optigrove, uh, discussion? Mr. Zawada? Um, on page 11, uh, under basically student uh, honors, I was under understanding that this had been discussed prior to us, uh, me being on the board back in October, I believe, 2021. Uh, and it was my understanding of me watching uh, the video of the, the YouTube that basically the question came up about the valedictorian and salutatorian. And then I was under the understanding through earlier to this week that this was going to be put back in. And if there was an issue, uh, we discussed that if it was too much pressure on the valedictorian or salutatorian that they didn't want to public speak, it would be added, you know, the next person down the line or somebody else would be, because we don't want to put anybody under pressure that they don't need to be put under. Uh, I'm not looking at that, but I think it's something that should be acknowledged and, and noted in somebody's, um, in their packet or whatever you want to call it, their history, whatever. So when they do go to college, or um, that's a plus when colleges are looking at that kind of stuff, not just necessarily the GPA. So my concern was about taking that out and going back to the original solid touring, valid touring. That was voted on by the school board to move from valedictorian salutatorian to using the Greek um, language uh, to acknowledge our students. Certainly the um, language within the program of study is acknowledging that the top two students who would have earned those positions would have the opportunity first to be speakers and then if they should not want it then it would go to um, uh, either administration, you know, seeking to a point or moving to another uh, way of uh, selecting our speakers, but certainly the class president also gets to speak. So the way it's written now, that's going to go away about touring South touring. By 2025, there's no longer going to be the announcement of a valid Victorian salutatorian. It will be, again, moving to the, to the Greek uh, language, yes. Summa cum laude, cum laude. Thank you. Zero. C could I ask why? I mean, we've had this for so long, number one. Number two, if the person doesn't want to speak, the way I read this, then somebody else would pick who the speaker is going to be. I, I'm thinking mentally, in my mind, it'll be a popularity contest. Well, I don't we, care we who can the committee is. Certainly it's avoid a popularity contest, but I do know that Mrs. Deroff, the high school administration explained um, when this was pushed, put forward to the board, um, why they were seeking to move from valid Victorian salutatorian, and it had more to do with the um, competition for these spots and, and taking courses that otherwise 
um, they may not have really been vested in. And I'm going to ask Dr. Foley to, to be able to come up to the podium because um, I believe that this was approved at a school board meeting last year, <coughs> that in 2025 we were moving away from that. I realize it was, but I maybe I had time to think in the last year. I don't know, but I, I don't like the idea of somebody else picking mm -hmm. For someone to speak when that child worked 12 years, 13 years to get the marks that he got, he or she, and I, I don't know, I got a problem with that. Well, Thank we're you. not refused. We're, we would still be. Oh, I know, I know. But okay. in case it, I don't know. When I went to school back in the Stone Age, they didn't. We didn't have a choice. If if we earned the spot, we spoke. And is that the problem? We don't want to make anybody do something they don't want to do. <laughs> As we, as we discussed the last time, first of all, the, the decile system that we're looking at, which is the Latin version of these things, it gives more students opportunities. <clears throat> yes, there are some situations where these students may not want to speak. So if they don't want to speak, then the answer would be is, is then we would have an opportunity for someone else to speak. Um, I know you mentioned something about a popularity contest. What we're looking at is, is with the administration and some English teachers and things like that, students would then have a little audition, and then they would be selected from that audition who would be speaking from this point forward, if they choose to. However, one and two still have the opportunity to speak. Can I respond to that? If, if they didn't want to speak, to me that's silly to say, for any 12th grader to say I don't want to speak, but however, if they don't want to speak, couldn't they write a speech that somebody, that the English teacher or you or somebody would, would, could give? I mean, these are their own words. That could be a possibility, but what we discussed prior to this was is that we would have an opportunity for students to audition to speak if they didn't want to, if they didn't want to speak themselves. So, but it's a, it's a possibility. I mean, we still have some time. This doesn't take effect until 2025. So we still have a couple of years to work out those pieces if, if we choose to do something different. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Ms. Nye? As I recall, there was a lot of carrying on back then when we made this decision also. And I kind of, are we committed in writing to doing it this way now? Or can we change it again? We can certainly bring it back to um, if, if, if the the school board, if a majority of the board doesn't wish to move away from salutatorian valedictorian, um, by the time we get to 2025, it certainly could be reviewed. And then I guess my next question would be, if going down the list, the first person doesn't want it or the second person doesn't want it, why wouldn't we go to the third person that would be in line rather than doing what you want to do. I mean, there are a lot of options that we could do moving forward. Um, that could be one of the things to move forward. It's just my past experience has been that sometimes if you give other students an opportunity to speak, it, it just works out so that everybody has an equal opportunity to speak at that point. So, I just think this might be something that we just need to bring back up again and have more discussion on it because it doesn't seem like people are happy with it. Ms. Hogan. Thank you, Mr. Brophy. Um, I'm sorry to, Dr. Foley, <laughs> sorry, I don't want to make you sit down again. And I'll get just back up. <laughs> um, so I just, I just want to make sure that I understand you're saying that one and two will still have the opportunity to speak and that a third student could also. Correct. No. The way it works right now is, is the class president always speaks. Right. Okay. Sorry. So yeah. then you have the other two student speakers have typically been one and two. Okay. All right. So if moving forward, if one and two does not want to speak, then what we would do is take that. If one wanted to speak and one didn't, then we would just audition for one. Right. If neither one wanted to speak, then we'd audition for the two. So one and two are guaranteed a spot. They have an they opportunity to speak. Not to take it. If they yeah. choose not to do it, then we would go to another option. Okay. And then. Um, just from my recollection, and I know it was quite a while ago, um, but I remember, I don't remember if it was you who presented or some, but Mr. Mayori maybe, um, but they said there was, as Ms. Torcher said, a lot of competition and a lot of um, kids taking classes that maybe they weren't really interested in just so they could get that bump to get up. 
Um, and I think that's one of the reasons was cited as one of the reasons why we're, we were shifting to this, um, because it would really allow kids to take classes that they're interested in, um, that would help them in college and then like develop them, you know, as learners and students and they're in the fields that they're interested in. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that that was, that I, I'm re recollecting that correctly. Yep. You are correct. That okay. was part of our discussion with that. Yes. Yeah. Cause I think that was kind of like the main, the main reason, right? That's one of the main reasons besides also acknowledging a wider body of students. Correct. Yeah, yeah. That was one of the main reasons. And also knowing that the deciles, especially when colleges and universities ask us, they don't ask us for one and two. They ask us for who's the top 10, who's the top 20 percent of the class, not the top right. 10 students, but the top percentage of the class. Right. Okay, great. Thank you. I appreciate it. Any other questions? Mr. Zawada. Um, really, it's two. The first one, I want to thank Ms. Torsha for when we explained the other courses mm -hmm. and for other board members explained to them. They're 100% right. I'd rather have them taking something that's sitting in study hall. So I appreciate the explanation on that. My question now is whether to the Mr. President or Mr. Uh, solicitor, uh, can we move now to make that change in the draft now to reinstate the valedictorian and salutatorian if we have the votes now? We would not be able to because it was something that was in policy, so we would need to bring that policy back yeah. forward. Okay. Thank you. Is that, is that correct? That is correct. Oh. She did. I have to go to policy to do that. Right. We would bring, if, if, if this board it wants to bring that policy forward to reevaluate prior to 2025, we certainly can. Because this, the, this is not. Right. We can move and take a vote to bring forward that policy to bring it, you know, Who, to revisit. At our, we have a policy committee. I know we're all committee of the whole, but do we have a designated policy uh, committee? I'm the liaison. Okay, so if the liaison is willing to put that on the agenda for a future uh, meeting, then we can move forward on that basis and have it as an agenda item. I don't think we need necessarily a vote. No. Uh, obviously, there's an intent to discuss it, at least amongst a number of your board members, and uh, we'll see where it goes. That would be a, a, meet of a, a committee of the whole meeting, and it would, the policy would be the specific portion of that meeting that we would go through that. So the request would have to come in. Who would the request come in to? The, the policy liaison? It would go to the policy liaison, and then the policy liaison would then review it with the administration and uh, would uh, then uh, eventually make its way to a committee of the whole meeting. Okay. So in that case, Mr. Zawadi, you'd have to, you'd have to I guess, approach the policy committee with that. Uh, does, can one board member do it? Does that have to be a, a certain number of board members? It, it really doesn't matter. It, it really is. In order for something to get on the agenda, there's two methodologies. Mm -hmm. uh, methodology number one, there's a request that's made to the uh, committee chair and the committee chair agrees and agrees to move it right. forward. Right. Uh, the The next uh, option is if there is no willingness on the part of the committee chair, then the board can take an action to uh, direct that that issue gets addressed at a future meeting. Okay, is it by three board members or five? Uh, what the to, the to, board act the board can take an action by a majority vote of the okay. board. Okay, that's good. That's, that's but good. an individual yeah. can make a request to. that something gets on the uh, on the right. agenda of a particular uh, committee of the whole uh, meeting, and it's up to the right. committee chair as to whether or not he or she will move it forward. That's good. Okay, thank you. Okay with that, Brian. Mr. Hemingway. Okay. I'll put it in, in an email to you. That's so it's black and white. Mm -hmm. I would probably direct you at first to maybe review the presentation from the previous meeting too. You know, maybe. 
Yeah, just that, yeah, that, that, I that. looked at October 12th, 2021. That's what I was told was when it was. I remember watching Mr. Stout and Dr. Foley present it. Right. And it was, it was brought up the further? questions there. Yeah. I did not remember seeing a vote at that time. So I don't know if that's when it was voted on. That's fine. Uh, I, mean, I did review. Yeah. I mean, we'll, I looked at. Yeah, we'll move on that for this and make the request and we'll go to, uh, to a future right. policy meeting. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. So. Really make the, the motion oh. for me, but we need to vote. Okay. We did. We did do the. Did you get the motions? I believe so. Yes. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay, that's yeah. right. It was so long ago, I forgot. <laughs> okay. Uh, so the discussions are done. Uh, roll call vote, please. Mr. Panarello. Yes. Mr. Updegrove. Yes. Mr. Zawada. Yes. Mrs. Scott. Yes. Ms. Deroff. Yes. Mr. Hemingway? Yes. Mrs. Hogan? Yes. Ms. Nyman? Yes. Mr. Brophy? Yes. Motion carries. Next up, we're looking for the Board of School Directors to approve the creation of a student activity account for the Walk for Lives. This account is needed to deposit money received to make payments for buying t-shirts, to sell catering events, grants for funds to a dualified provider of help, um, such as the United Way, Your Way Home Initiative Fund. Hogan moves. Dear off seconds. Hogan moves. Dear off second. Discussion, please. Mr. Zawada. Upon learn, uh, we've had this discussion. I've been talking to different board members. Uh, as far as this particular group, um, they do specialize in um, in students' um, suicide and hotline. So, but it wasn't pointed out. So my question is to the solicitor now, um, are we able to be, being that it's an already an established committee, or, or um, basically, are we as school board members are allowed to question materials or anything that's being presented in that club? Or, I mean, is it, are we able to, being that it's, it is a school function, it's not funded by the school, but it's, it's school students, are we allowed to ask maybe what their mission or give a presentation to the board exactly what they do? I don't believe we have a policy per se here that addresses the formation of clubs, nor do we have any kind of policy that dictates our overview of clubs so your question is a very interesting one so Can I add on that? yes so this is a student activity um, club governed by student activity rules of PDE um, all of the expenditures would need to be approved by the students that raise the funds um, the students and the class advisor um, the guidelines are very formalized by PDE so there wouldn't be school board oversight but they would be approved by the um, individual students that are involved with the student activity I, 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 the, the PDE regulations and state law requires us to approve the activity accounts, but it does not necessarily grant us specific authority to probe into one particular club versus another. Do we have an idea of how many clubs we have? Uh, we have probably, well, Mr. Foley... At the high school, there we have the most. At the elementary schools, um, it's basically by grade. But at the um, high school, I don't know, Dr. Foley, if you have the number. I, I don't have. I have a rough number. If we're talking about just clubs, or we're talking about clubs with fiduciary accounts, because that's different. We have a lot of clubs. We probably have about sixty clubs, and those are all clubs that are running with uh, advisors and things going on within the school. Um, I would. However, the ones that have fiduciary accounts are the ones that would be raising money for certain things which would go through. And as the auditors talked earlier in our presentation, those rules all changed in June of last year as well. So this summer, Mrs. D Nicola, her office, and myself in particular put together a whole set of packets of information that has the very strict guidelines on how this all works, including their notes, how they run their meetings, what, what students are allowed to do what. 
Um, so when we look at that, there's probably, we probably have about 40 clubs that are in fiduciary accounts. So, okay, so getting back to your uh, specific question, it doesn't appear as we, uh, as if you as a board automatically have the right to request specific information about one club versus another. Could the board theoretically develop a policy that addresses the extent to which you want to have oversight over clubs? Theoretically, yes. I have not seen many boards go into that area, uh, nor uh, have I seen higher levels of concern about clubs, but if the board wants to get involved in the process of sanctioning clubs, that is something that I would suggest that you address through the policy uh, function of the board. But I think if a board is going to go in that direction, I'm not so sure that we can pick one club versus another. I think you would need to do that kind of review on all of the clubs versus singularly looking at one club versus another, unless per se there was some financial fraudulent issues that would uh, arise. We do report on the weekly checklist any payment out of any bank account that is held by the school district. I don't believe prior to um, current administration that that was done, but we report every payment that comes out of any district bank account. That would include the fiduciary, fiduciary funds of the student activity and scholarships as well. So I, you would see those payments. I, I think what I was reading, and maybe I misconstrued what Mr. Zawada was saying, I thought he was more interested in looking at the mission and or uh, certain of the documentation in the club versus the club's financial uh, expenditures. The financial expenditures are already being addressed. So I was trying to address if the board wants to go beyond the financial end, that I think that would have to be addressed most effectively by board policy. Again, it's it's um, transparency. So parents know, students know what the the class or what the club is about. My other question is, if we have roughly forty clubs that have fiduciaries, why are we voting? Why are the why wouldn't these, are all these other clubs going to have to have to open up bank accounts? No, we have one bank account for each fiduciary group. So we have a bank account for the student activity. Um, fiduciary duties and we have one for the scholarships. They're separated out within the um, within each of those in the accounting records by type of club or type of scholarship. So we can do individualized reporting um, but they are all in one bank account. So Every time a new student activity account wants to be opened that's what you'll see on the board agenda. So that's creation of a new um, student activity club in the, like the high school or the elementary school or middle school. So back to my, um, again, I'm, so this club's existed last year and prior years. Were no, they, they, they were, would be new. They're new clubs now? They're new clubs now? No, they're not new. No, no, these, these, these clubs are not necessarily new. It's just now they've decided that they wanted to start raising funds to donate to like multi-serve and those other places. So we have a lot of clubs in the school that have no fiduciary accounts at all because they just want to get together with their friends and, and do whatever on like a, a sports club, for example, where they want to play sports. Um, but not everybody will apply for a fiduciary account. Just these two particular right now that we're looking for, the one in particular we're talking about now, is a, is a club that they've decided that you know, they would raise funds for specific organizations in this particular case the united way was one of them and the other one was is the um, your way home for homeless and and uh, other children that are struggling let so. me ask a question of ms danicola have we as a board approved all of the fiduciary accounts even those those that were in place a decade ago to my knowledge, yes. Every time a new um, club that was going to be raising funds as a student activity, that was brought before the board. So, quick, uh, and again, um, so these clubs didn't raise money last year? 
No. Okay. That's that's the new aspect that you're asked to vote on right now. Thank you. Sorry. No, it's okay. I'm Thank sorry. you. I was looking up something. No, it's okay. Um, so just a quick question, probably to Dr. Foley. Who's, who sanctions these clubs now? Right now, when, when you say sanction them? Like who, who I, I guess, say a bunch of kids want to form a club for basketball or something. Um, they approach who? How does that happen? Yeah, the process that we go through is, is they come and they meet with administration. And then we say, all right, so based upon what you're saying to me now, you're going to be looking at this. You have to find an advisor. So then the students will go back and find an advisor, and then based upon that, they'll create that. Once that happens, then we ask the advisor to say, hey, yes, this is the club that I'm going to be help advising and doing these things. And sometimes it's they'll meet after school once a week for from three to four, and you know, like I say, like you say, and play a game of basketball um, or whatever that activity could be. But the point is, is yes, that's kind of the way it happens now. I have an idea. I would really like to do this. I have an advisor. Once everything is in place and we say this is a, a good place or a safe place for them to be, then, then that's how it moves forward. So you would say that they're student-driven? Oh, they're all student-driven, yeah, every student one of driven. them. Okay. Um, and they're, they're completely voluntary. No student is forced into a club. Yeah, they're completely voluntary. Absolutely voluntary. Okay. Um, oh, I thought someone snapped. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and um, these these are self-supporting clubs financially, right? Yes, you said that. Um, so as far as how do students know like what clubs are available? Is there like a list? How do they how do they how do they know? Like you know. <laughs> well, first of all, word of mouth. Mm -hmm. You know, they're friends. Number two, there's if you go to the website, all the clubs are listed there. And as um, we talked about earlier, the, the link crew is on, in fact, tomorrow going to have a club fair. So what will happen is, is they'll have an opportunity for freshmen and other students to, to go down and look at what clubs are available. Because we know that connective tissue to the school is real important. Anything we can get kids involved in school with, we're going to try to do. Right. So they're transparent and kids can access them. They know that they exist. There's different ways for them to, to look into what's available to them. They're student driven. Um, they're self-funding, they're voluntary. Um, I think these actually sound like really great things. And personally, I, I commend these students for wanting to, um, to, to serve our community by raising funds. So um, that's all I have. Thank you, I appreciate it. Uh, let, let, let me raise one other issue just for the uh, uh, benefit of the board. And uh, I think your questions uh, point to that. In 1984, the federal government passed what is known as the Equal Access Act of 1984. And that law provides, um, it prevents public schools that receive federal funds, like Boyertown, to uh, deny students their rights to participate in student-initiated clubs. Um, uh, on First Amendment grounds. So if we don't like, and I'll use, uh, a, a, you know, the Snake Healer Society of uh, Pennsylvania, if we don't like that, the viewpoints espoused by that group, we do not have a legal right to restrict that particular student-initiated group from uh, participating in the school. So we have limited rights that is already statutorily regulated. The separate issue is one of accounting on how we account for student funds in the fundraising basis. But if, if for example, we do not like the mission or the viewpoints espoused by a particular student initiated group, we have limitations under the Equal Access Act of 1984 under the circumstances. If we refuse all federal funds, we're not subject to that, but that would not make uh, Patty very happy. But what we're, okay. what, I think what we're talking about tonight is policy 618, mm -hmm. which is strictly 
the account, the mm -hmm. establishment of the account. I understand, but the yeah. question that but Mr. Zavato. That's, that's what we're supposed to be yeah, told, but we're, today, we're way today's off vote, Today's <laughs> vote is just simply approving the financial accounting perspective, but reading between the lines uh, in Mr. Zawada's question, I wanted to mention that we do have uh, limitations under the Equal Access Act of 1984. Okay. So I guess my question is if we refuse to, to allow, we, we, if, we, if we say no tonight to them opening the account, we're just, we're, we're not allowing them to do any fundraising, but that's not having any effect on the establishment of the club per se. Theoretically, no. So we, we would just be hindering their ability to function. Uh, that is correct. First, let me uh, that, but uh, I mean, there may be, uh, you know, I, I, I'd rather not go into too much more detail. Okay, at this point in time, but it, it raises questions. All right. I'm, first of all, I want to state I'm not against any club. Any club can be here. I'll support any club. Anybody's passion is welcome to join that club. These particular two clubs, uh, um, and I know we're working on the first one, but they all seem to be lumped together. If you looked at the application, it was some concerning information put down by what they do. So my concern was I don't want to not fund. Like I said, I learned a little bit more about the walk thing. Uh, my concern is, um, and it was brought up earlier by a, a comment from the from our parents that basically is there is there a way that we can know where the money's going that it doesn't turn into into a political donation um, is does that do we have that authority mr. Sultanic to say you know that we you know that where that money is particularly going not that it turns hey United Way a lot of these uh, you know this homeless stuff is hundred percent we don't audit right. these accounts do we the um, financial statement auditors will audit them as part of their testing. So as part of their testing, we would theoretically know where checks were cut out of these particular clubs. All of the checks are cut by the business office. And all of them are reviewed prior to being um, issued to make sure that they have the required student sign-offs, the student documentation. Do we maintain a specific list of those checks that are cut from this group mm -hmm. so theoretically that's public information correct but we hold no we hold no we don't audit them yeah. per se right. and we don't say we don't like that you wrote a check to this particular vendor nor do we have the authority to stop them do we probably not i think so Probably not. Is there, can there be a policy added or discussed? And well, you, we can always talk about policy. You know, it, it's, it, you know, let me use an example once again. If they were giving money to a terrorist organization, okay, let me use an extreme example that doesn't get too politically polarized uh, under the circumstances. Um, that might be an issue where it might raise a concern on, uh, you know, uh, finances behalf. We've never had that situation before. Uh, and the question is, if the board passes a policy that it wants to review this, then you're almost creating a responsibility on our part to view those expenditures and then intervene at certain times. I think we would need to think very carefully about the extent to which we want to regulate. We run in these issues to take it out of this context. Also, similar issues with respect to booster clubs. How do we regulate booster clubs who raise money? What? And we they don't currently because they're usually separate and autonomous entities. And some districts have seen their booster clubs treasurer abscond with all of the money that was raised on behalf of a particular team. And there is always this um, view as to the extent to which the board 
this board would try to get involved and regulate an autonomous 501c3 booster club under the circumstances that raises funds. So the issue is whenever we want to regulate, we also then assume a level of responsibility. And in the case of booster clubs, most districts don't regulate because we don't have enough resources to go and check into on a daily basis what they're going to do. You know, if we're going to start regulating booster clubs per se, Patty's team would have to go and look on a regular basis to see the legality of the expenditures and the deposits. And most districts are saying that that's a separate organization. We don't want it to reflect badly on our students, but there's how far do we want to extend our review and grasp. That is an issue of policy that we won't decide tonight. No, I understand that. But also the booster clubs are not a student activity. They're right? Am I correct? They're, They're parents. They are separate organizations. Right. They're not part of the school district. I would just like to review policy 618 and under the delegation of responsibility, the superintendent or designee is responsible for developing the administrative regulations governing student activity uh, funds. However, the building principal is responsible for working with students and advisors, implementing policies, procedures, and maintaining fiscal records. The principal shall serve as custodian of the funds and shall approve all checks drawn upon them. So we do have safeguards in place. Um, that is our role, our job as administrators to you know, supervise and administer. So I believe you know, at this point that it would fall back to Dr. Foley and then my little limited knowledge of accounting is that we have safeguards in place that he doesn't get to, to sign off the check and approve it. Then that comes towards um, to Ms. Denicola and I can guarantee you that anything that is not um, where it should be, won't be moving forward. Ms. Nyman. Okay. For example, they have down here United Way and Your Way Home as fun things. <coughs> can we say somehow that that's only the people that they can give to, or can they change that at any time and give to whoever they want? They can give... Uh, uh, they, uh, I'm sure they're going to be fundraising on a continuous basis, and they generally have their autonomous right to contribute where they want on a regular basis. And I think the question is, do we want to, as a board, police that or not? If you're reading their basic purpose is to fundraise for families in emotional crises who are lacking basic needs. That's the purpose for, uh, I'm sorry, that's Walk for Lives. Uh, yeah, let me, the, yes, that's, yeah, that, that, that is their, their purpose. So if we're going to um, say that some people um, fit this and some people don't, I think that um, that would not mend well. I, I think that if they're identifying people who perhaps couldn't afford a Thanksgiving um, dinner and they put a basket together to help supply a healthy meal, um, that's great. Go ahead. And, and I understand that and I'm all for that, you know, helping everybody out that you can. But what happens if it's Manny, Moe, and Jack down the, the, the lane who really don't need it, but I mean, there's got to be some type of control, or my next question would be to Mrs. Danicola, the auditors don't necessarily come in and audit all of these accounts. So they could be doing something that wouldn't strictly be by the books. That could happen, but I would tell you in my experience, the auditors always touch on student activity accounts at some level. They're not going to test every single item, but they'll take a sample to make sure it has the appropriate documentation. Um, they're not required to test it annually, but in my experience, they do test all of the accounts um, at some level each year. Again, it's, it's to be supervised by administration. And administration is going to be supporting, you know, what the club's activity would be. It goes back to supervision. 
and and what the role of the the administrator is in that building as well as as the person who is guiding them there 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 are teachers um, so I believe that we have the responsibility to be able to determine that you know is this a good place for it to to go or not and to have that discussion with the the group okay I'm gonna vote for this tonight with the thing that we do some looking at putting some policies in place Policies are, by the word of policies and procedures, would be the um, works that Dr. Foley and his team would be using. It wouldn't be a policy that we would adopt necessarily um, with, with aspects to their funds being expended. I'm sorry. The focus of the group. How are they selling themselves to students? What, what do you know? In this particular case, um, it's a group of students that walk, just like when you did uh, the, 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 the walkathons okay. and those kind of things. They walk and they do that in to earn money so that they can provide these organizations. Okay, so yeah. That's it. Yeah. Okay. They're, they're, they're trying just to help what others. It says. Okay. Helping each other. Yeah. Okay. Okay, roll call vote, please. Mr. Panarello. Yes. Mr. Updegrove. Yes. Mr. Zawada. Yes. Mrs. Scott. Yes. Ms. Deeroff. Yes. Mr. Hemingway. Yes. Mrs. Hogan. Yes. Ms. Nyman. Yes. Mr. Brophy. Yes. Motion carries. Next, I will be looking for the Board of School Directors to approve the creation of a student activity account for the Impact Club. <clears throat> the Impact Club student activity account is, uh, Impact Club is focused on leadership. The Impact Club will work on promoting connections, acceptance, and inclusions. Um, those are some of the things that they have written down as their intended purpose. They have been working together and um, the responses back from our school counseling supervisors that they are really doing good work. Um, Dr. Foley, could you elaborate a little bit? Sure, this is a group that is representative of the entire school population. And what I mean by that is, is anybody and everybody is welcome to be part of this club. Um, this is a club that has done training with Tom Stecker, which was the consultant that we worked with throughout the school district prior, which is where this leadership piece comes in. And from this point, they've actually taken stuff that they learned from their whole student body, and they actually did a presentation to our entire staff to say, hey, just so you understand, when you do this, we do this. So we want you to help us go in this direction. So they give a lot of really good feedback. And this group of kids are so passionate and energetic, like it, they're fun to watch. Uh, their most recent thing that they're working on right now is, is working with ADL and working in the, uh, the Build a Better uh, Boyertown community. And they're actually coming up with some ideas for the mural that's going to be re replaced and redone. So they're working very strong and very hard with kids in the, in the school as well as students and community things outside of the school. So that's why they're, they're looking at both areas of these, this so it's a pretty interesting club. It, it's, it's a lot of fun. Again, I am looking for a motion from the Board of School Directors to approve the creation of student activity account for the Impact Club. Deerhoff Hogan moves. Oh. Hogan seconds. Deerhoff uh, moves. Hogan second. Discussion. Um, Dr. Foley, can you spell Stacker or the gentleman's last name? It's Stacker. I think it's S-T-E-C-H-E-R. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? With that, move for roll call vote. Mr. Panarello. No. Mr. Uptegrove. Yes. Mr. Zawada. No. Mrs. Scott. No. Ms. Deeroff. Yes. Mr. Hemingway. Yes. Mrs. Hogan. Yes. Ms. Nyman. No. Mr. Brophy. Yes. 5-4 motion carries. Next, I'll be looking for the Board of School Directors to approve the personnel agenda items as presented. A lot of motions. Okay, a lot of uh, motions. Up to go 
second. Any discussion? I see no discussion, so roll call vote, please. Mr. Panarello? Yes. Mr. Updegrove? Yes. Mr. Zawada? Yes. Mrs. Scott? Yes. Ms. Deeroff? Yes. Mr. Hemingway? Yes. Mrs. Hogan? Yes. Ms. Nyman? Yes. Mr. Brophy? Yes. Motion carries. That completes my report, Mr. Brophy. Okay, any old business? No. Okay, no old business. We'll go to uh, public comment period number two. Let me get to that one. Uh, no, just two, okay. We have some people signed up to... Uh, to speak at this one, so let me read the requirements. On behalf of the school board, the board of school directors, I would like to welcome you to this meeting. We welcome your attendance and input from stakeholders to assist us with, with making recommendations and decisions related to the Board 10 Area School District. This procedure and rules for public participation are detailed in PSID Port Policy 903. This document is available on the BASD website. Participants properly registered with the board secretary will be recognized by the presiding officer. Public period comment period number two is for persons wishing to discuss any district items not, not appearing on the evening agenda. Participants must preference their comments by announcement of their name. Participants are encouraged to direct all statements, inquiries, and questions to the presiding office and to the board as a whole. Note that we value and will not compromise the privacy of our students and staff. Please see us outside the realm of public meeting if you have a concern about an individual staff member or student. If your public comment includes a question, Mrs. Torsha or a member of her staff will be in contact with you to confirm your question and provide you with information. Comments are limited to three minutes and comment periods time is limited to 30 minutes. Finally, note that we do record our board and committee meetings and we post them on YouTube with a link to our website. Request if you do wish to take pictures or record the meeting yourself, you do so in a non-disruptive and discreet manner and use those materials respectfully and responsibly. First, first one will be Krista Collins. Good evening. Um, first, I just wanted to go back to the Impact Club because the summary was not actually read in full. I think that some words were picked and chosen and specifically left out when Ms. Torshia read it. Um, this is an SEL-focused leadership group. Um, they will plan and lead SEL fundraising activities such as SEL Unity Day. And again, that is not necessarily a bad thing. I'm not here to say that it is necessarily a bad thing. Okay? But the questions come in when they're talking about professional services such as speakers and presenters for Unity Day and travel to SEL summer camps. Who are they sending to the summer camps? What are these camps? What are the agenda? What is the curriculum on the summer camp? You need to look into all of these things and understand what they are. And I'm just going to say it. This is how drag queen story time happens in elementary schools. Okay? Not necessarily, but yes, it does happen and that is a reality. So we need to be making sure that we're promoting good things for kids and not bad things for kids and then parents find out after it happened. Okay? So that's number one. Number two is I wanted to speak to the board about concerns required regarding curricular materials. The days of simply publishing a state approved curriculum and moving on are a thing of the past. As parents, we know what is best for our kids and we want to know the details of what our children are learning. Residents and taxpayers also have the right to know what our tax, tax dollars are funding. One of the biggest takeaways from the November 10th curriculum presentation is that curricular materials lack proper vetting and oversight within the district. The current policy that pretty much any teacher is free to pick their curricular materials without them being reviewed and bring them into the classroom is exactly how a critical race theory worksheet ended up in the hands of an entire class of 12-year-old students at Boyertown West. While I understand that this issue was brought to the attention of the principal and the administration and that the worksheet has since been removed, that does not change the fact that it never should have happened in the first place. As a board, you have the authority and the expectation to 
protect our students from all kinds of indoctrination. For example, when I dropped off pocket constitutions to be handed out to eighth graders during Constitution Week, these booklets had to be vetted before being given to the student body. That was the appropriate thing to do, and I thanked the person that did it. Um, why are we not doing this for everything, including curricular materials presented by the teachers? I am requesting that the board make a motion to create new policies or change existing policies as needed to keep questionable curricular materials out of the hands of children. These children have so much to learn and have bright futures ahead of them. I cannot imagine why anyone would sit back and allow discussions about a child's privilege or oppression based on their race, gender, or religious beliefs. This is getting out of hand and it needs to stop. We we keep telling you that we want our children taught how to think, not what to think. Please put policies in place that help accomplish this simple ask. Thank you. Nicole Zillix, Impact Club and Walk for Life Club. That was number one. Number two. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Policy 903 and policy. I'm sorry. Yeah, still in the first one. you're up, please. Policy 93 and policy and curriculum materials. Good evening. Barb Furman, New Hanover Township. First of all, I want to really praise those children and the leaders of the um, Elkson's group. They are practicing the value of work, hard work and discipline. And uh, we thank them for that. So love thy neighbor. This community has done amazing things together. I have been involved in a number of things and all of them. And I see people that sit here that I know have been involved in them. They're designed to do what is best for children. First of all, I'm grateful for nine people to represent us on the school board. We elect the people, and we cannot watch everything. We elect you because we trust your judgment. So when things are not going uh, the way we would want, then, of course, the next election comes. I've attended school board meetings, township meetings, county commissioner's meetings, many of them. The success of the leadership weighs heavily on letting the public speak freely and honestly. Town hall style, pros and cons, and things such as, uh, of things such as masking, which I've asked for for over a year, and political ideology creeping into our children's classrooms. We need more time to speak, and we need to speak with each other, to each other, in a town hall fashion. An open policy that allows people to speak at meetings even when they have not signed up ahead of time, as in policy 903, should be uh, implemented. Books and resources in classrooms and at the children's fingertip at school is a different issue than censorship and banning books. You speak about all the mental health issues that you must deal with. We lament the lower test scores. State safety in the school is an issue every week. Children are getting at the least confusing messages from adults that may not align with the values at home. When I taught for 35 years, I was not a mental health expert but I cared about the wellness of children. The teacher was always secondary to the child and the parents. If you wonder why one of the most active defenders of our public schools has taken a 180 degree turn, we did not leave the public, public education. Public education left us. Time. Thank you. Okay, now Nicole's Oaks. Community and board input. Good evening, Nicole's Oaks. Um, actually, I'm going to speak a little bit about the Impact um, Club. Um, 
since it was brought up, I'm really sad and disheartened that four board members voted no for this. Um, I'm really unsure why. I know there's a lot of questions about wanting to control these clubs, voluntary clubs. Um, so I really suggest you speak to your solicitor in regards to the legality of that, because I really think that there are a lot of questions of whether or not that is even something the board could do um, in regards to trying to control, say, what they're raising money for or anything like that. So I suggest you have that conversation with the solicitor. Um, also, um, I know there's been a lot of talk about the 57 bus lately from multiple people in the community, and I want to thank them because I actually bought the book and read it this weekend. Um, there is some profanity, and people in the story do um, are gay, transsexual, or see themselves as neither female or male or both. Um, but my takeaway from this book was the, va the value in it um, and this being a nonfiction book, which means it actually did happen. Um, it was well written. It was extremely emotional. And there were so many lessons to be learned um, in this book, including forgiveness, compassion, remorse, all these things. So I high, highly suggest if any board member wants to ban this book from our schools, they read it first. I have a copy and you're more than welcome um, to borrow it if you like. I hope you all have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Thank you. Cassandra Roney. Cassandra Roney. Um, I think a 40 year old woman's review of a book is different than 11, 12 year old. I think you would all agree it's not the same thing. It doesn't matter, you're over 40. Um, so at the last meeting, um, many people said leave it to the experts and the educators. Um, I disagree. I think we've been forced to question various aspects and what hides behind them. Uh, when curriculum was reviewed at the last meeting, it was mentioned that locked items were out of the district's control. There were areas at the bottom of the screen, clearly unlocked, within the district's control. That section is curricular materials, so change it. This is the exact section that I've had two assignments removed this school year from seventh grade. They weren't taken off just for my opinion. Whatever you choose to call it, DEI, CRT, SEL, it doesn't matter. Um, it was found this school year and in our district. We need a policy code committee, again, I don't care what you call it, um, to take the time to check random teachers for these types of devices and materials. No one will get this done without some action and less excuses. The teacher and principal were involved in preventing the questionable material in the seventh grade ELA class, but that will not prevent me from coming here and speaking about it so that other parents, teachers, or anyone is aware and more involved. For any concerned parents, there is an opt-out form on pji.org if you would like to prevent this negative data farming, I recommend checking the private information section. Our effort is not to blame educators, as some of you are unaware of the agenda. Some of our educators aren't brave enough to say no. I have no doubt there is pressure from the union, state, and federal levels, but we have to stand against the underlying agenda. It is the opposite of inclusion. It's grooming. Also, lastly, the board behavior is a huge concern. We need new leadership on the board. Imagine saying you have no comment because you don't want to add to the drama. Or you sit there and thank by name every public speaker Oh, except the ones you didn't agree with. Or that you dread listening to the community speak. <sighs> Get off the board or step it up. The problem exists and saying that concerned parents are not preventing facts, which was also stated by one of you at the last meeting. 
here's the assignments. It doesn't get more factual than the assignments in my hand. Stop denying the problem. Stop saying you can't change it because at last meeting you said you could change it. It was within your control. Move on to board comments. Now tonight is board comments, not board debate. So when you go around, make your comments. I'm not coming around to anybody a second time tonight. We've turned we've turned a board comment meeting or portion of this board into a board debate back and forth. It's time to stop that. So when you make your comments, you'll go around once, and then we're done. Uh, start with Ms. Deroff. I just wanted to say how entertaining it was to have that group here tonight uh, with Taiwan. I can't even. Taekwondo. Taekwondo, sorry. And uh, I asked the questions of the age because some of our little children, if they start young enough and get taught some of the morals that they t teach in there, I think it would be very helpful to us. And I appreciate all the other questions that were asked by everyone not just a few that I liked and didn't like. And uh, I welcome the public to ask any questions they like. Hope everybody has a lovely holiday, and I hope that they think about what they're doing when they come to our board meetings, because the children are watching. Thank you. Mr. Uptergrove. I don't have any comment, except for the fact that I want to wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving. This is Scott. I just want to say happy Thanksgiving. Thank you to the parents. Um, we do have some policy work to do, but we can get to that, uh, in, you know, after the new year possibly. But anyway, thank you all. And thank you for that presentation, um, Allison, because now I know what I can do with my grandson because he needs something like that. He's all over. So thank you. Mr. Zawada. Happy Thanksgiving to everybody in the board, the administration, the students, the community. I hope you have a great Thanksgiving and remember why we're celebrating Thanksgiving. Um, basically, one statement I want to make, and I think Tony and I agree on this, is we're not book banning. We're looking for a way to work with the administration that we can almost put some type of ratings on these books so the parents have to sign off, whether it's PG-13 like the movies or rated X. I'm not asking for, but if a parent should know if they want their child to read this. So we're trying to figure out a way, but we're not trying to uh, ban books. I believe we need to set up a policy, um, and we'll have to do it at some point, that I think that there should be some type of uh, um, way for a parent to see what's going to be taught in their class. Um, if we need to sit down and start a, a committee to look into that with the administration. Uh, this year alone, uh, the House of Representatives and the Senate of Pennsylvania did pass a, um, a law, H.R. 382, um, 1382 rather, that was calling for um, transparency for teachers and their lessons. It was vetoed by the, the, the governor, but uh, basically it was passed by two of the branches out of the three so it's something to look into uh, I think every parent has the right to know ahead of time what the possibility what their children are going to learn and with that again I want to thank uh, the Taekwondo group they were phenomenal if we could it, it's almost like some of the countries that make their kids when they turn 18 have to serve in the service for two years before they're allowed to be in public because it does put a good training on them. Uh, and um, and I appreciate tonight and the back and forth what we got accomplished a lot of good ideas and again I can't really it enough I'm not trying to ban books as a cu curricular chair thank you and again have a happy Thanksgiving Miss Nyman okay wishing everybody a happy Thanksgiving um, after working the polls I did hear some feedback from different people in the community um, one being from some of our nurses staff um, about their 
unhappiness with the way things are. Uh, they're still leaving, even though they're Crest employees, there's still issues there. Um, they don't feel comfortable or they don't feel happy with the district. Uh, so I think we need to do some polling there as to what's going on because I saw that I think we lost two more of our staff nurses or that on our agenda again. So I'd like to look into that, see what's going on because I heard a lot. Um, but um, we do need to do some work on some policies and hopefully in the new year we can get things going and get moving again and enjoy your holiday, stay safe. Mr. Penrill. I want to start by thanking Lexi for being here. She did the whole thing tonight solo, so that was cool. Um, the karate class was awesome. Taekwondo, sorry. Um, that might be perfect for my little guy, too. I was thinking about that when they were talking. Um, what else do we have to address? So I want to clarify my votes tonight, because I'm sure people are wondering. Um, if it was written on that the way Ms. Torsh had said it, I would have voted for it. But it was riddled with SEL, which I don't agree with. So that's why my vote was there. Um, as far as everything else, everyone have a good Thanksgiving. Ms. Hogan. Thank you, Mr. Brophy. Um, yeah, so just to, to piggyback, um, SEL, social emotional learning, um, we have a mental health crisis among students and this curriculum teaches um, kids really much needed skills to navigate their emotions, to navigate um, relationships, friendships, relate any relationships. It's it's very very valuable. It is not political, um, and I wasn't even going to mention this, but I feel like um, when we were talking about integrity earlier, I feel that I I must. So when we're talking about, I hear it often, CRT, which is right now a political buzzword. CRT is critical race theory. I'm sure everyone knows this. It is a theory of law that is taught in law school. It's taught in some high-end sociology classes. It is not taught to high school students. It is not part of our curriculum, which I know um, has been discussed previously. Um, this is a political football, and it really has no place in this boardroom. Um, so those two things I feel very p passionate about. I feel that we should be teaching kids how to navigate their emotional world and how to connect to each other. Um, so I'm going to stand back off that right now. So um, thank you to Lexi. Always, it's always a pleasure to have you here. Um, I hope Olivia feels better soon. Please pass along, you know, my wishes, my well wishes. <laughs> um, just wanted to say happy Thanksgiving to everyone, to all my colleagues, to everyone in the public. And I always like to, uh, this is like a season of gratitude, so I want to give a big thank you to, you know, our teachers, our administrators, all of our staff who work so hard to, um, to give our kids all the opportunity that they have every day when they walk through our doors. And to the school board, who also works very hard. So thank you to my colleagues for the work that you guys do. Um, and that's all. So thank you. Mr. Hemingway. All right, just a quick, <clears throat> quick comment uh, to, to the public and also the board members when they do speak. Don't assume that I agree or disagree. I listen. That's my job is to listen. As leadership, I serve the entire board, not individuals or groups or cliques or whatever you want to call it. I feel the same when that branches out into the community. I serve the community, not any individual group. I base my decisions through what I'm listening and hearing and learning from all of us. And I try to base my decisions on what I think is best for the whole. My opinion doesn't matter. My job is to gather the facts, gather everyone's opinions, and, and try to drive a non-parental decision, a non-individual community member decision. But remember that I'm, I'm here to serve everyone. And from that is how I base my decisions. 
So don't assume anything whether I agree or disagree. A lot of times I have to make a decision, honestly, I don't like to make. It goes against what I personally would believe. So just watch how you speak to me, and I will do my best to serve everyone. Happy Thanksgiving. Okay, move to announcements, please. Our upcoming meetings will be December 6th, Board of School Directors Reorganization Meeting, 7 o'clock here at the Ed Center, and December 13th, Board of School Directors Meeting, which will be held at the First Career and Technology Center Ole Campus. This will be a virtual meeting for the public. And then we have our two meetings in the new year, January 10th and the 24th, and they will all be here, and we will move back to the buildings um, come February. Okay, with that, I'm looking for a motion. Nine, second. To grow that.